Hi everybody, Mr. Waz here, and welcome to another episode of Wazley Science. This is a special episode, this is part two of the Science of Science. With this episode, we are going to discuss how to create your data table and do it correctly along with graphs. And we're going to talk a lot about graphs. I'm going to show you how to make each kind of graph on Google Docs. And then finally, we're going to get into how to properly write your conclusion. All right, so let's start by talking about data tables. Data tables require very specific format, just like the graph does. And I think a lot of teachers don't necessarily lay out the format, so I'm gonna do it really plain and simple for you. First off, it, it has to have a title. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that students make, is they just don't put a title on a data table. You have to have a title on the data table. It's just as important as a title on your graph. The format that I prefer for you to have for your data table and your graph is just the effect of the IV on DV. Um, and it's essential for you to show the units of the IV and DV on the top of the data table below the title and nowhere else. You don't want to plug it into every single cell, every single trial. It'll just become redundant and just look silly. So you really want to make sure that your units are on top and I, I take points off for these things. I really like to see a neat and tidy data table. So if we look on the left side here, we can see that on their data table, they have their units written in every single time. That's not proper. And they also don't have labels and they lack a title. So that's really not the ideal situation. If we look on the right side, we see a title on top and we see the units. So this is week one, week two, week three. And we always have to have those units because if you look on the left side, like what is that one? Is it one year, one day, one hour? And we find out that it's weeks. And on the right side, we have the pounds here. So we can see that over three weeks, the dog lost four pounds. It's an easy data table to read. Uh, so that data table would be good. What I wanted to show you here was something in particular with the trials of a data table. You notice that I have my students put the trials on the side as opposed to on the top like this capped release data table here that many teachers have probably seen before. Um, the reason why I do that is because this data table in particular works fine because there are only three trials shown so then you can put the average all the way to the right but with most science you have several more than three trials so your data table needs to grow downward like a list as opposed to sideways lab reports are often done in a sort in a portrait style format not a landscape and even with a landscape you're still limited to like tr 20 trials or something so if you wanted to show your data you wouldn't be able to show it if you have the trials on top so it makes the most sense to have the trials on the side and then your independent variables on the top because you usually have a limited amount of independent variables. And then finally your average will be on the very bottom and followed by maybe a true value if you have obtained that by several trials. In high school and middle school you will commonly see four graphs. The first one is the bar graph. This one is used when graphing a number of unrelated items on the same chart. And then there is the scatter plot. The scatter plot shows how one variable is changed by another variable. Um, this, in this one, you do not connect the dots together. You actually will create a tread line, and I will show you that in a little bit. Uh, the third one is the line graph, which shows how one variable changes over time. Students often get scatter plots confused with line graphs. One suggestion that I have is way to remember is when you have time, make a line. And then finally we have the multiple line graph and this shows how various things are affected by something over the same time frame. Let's see if you can identify the four types of graphs by just looking at this. I'll give you a second here. Alright, so you can see that the bar graph is on the top left, the scatter plot is on the top right, the line graph is on the bottom left, and the multiple line graph is on the bottom right. So what I'm going to do for you now is show you how to make a graph using Google Docs. I prefer Google Docs over Microsoft Excel because it's a lot more simple 
and it's a lot easier for students to make it than put it on their lab report and share it and collaborate with others. I also prefer making graphs on computers as opposed to making them on paper because I find that's a very tedious, long-going process that never comes out that great and it's just frustrating for both me and the students. It's also not a very valuable skill for them when they choose their careers. I don't see any career that you will be making a graph on paper as opposed to making it on a computer. So to make this graph on Google Docs you just go to create spreadsheet and then you want to make sure to name your spreadsheet so you don't lose it. So I'm just gonna make a basic bar graph here. Um, I'm just gonna do prices of like various items here. So let's say you know, a bike is 800 and a video game is 50 an iPad, let's say is 200, actually it's probably like 400, that's the reality, and I don't know, Nintendo, Nintendo DS runs you for like 200, so there you go. Some various things there. So, all right, so you just highlight the things that you want to graph. I don't, you don't even really need to, actually. And then you can either click on this Insert Chart button over here, or you can just go to Insert and Chart. And at that point, you'll have, it will show you a bar graph, but you probably really want what is actually called a column gra graph, which makes a lot more sense, because bars are sideways and columns are vertical. All right, so now you have your column graph and the first thing I usually do is I get rid of that legend because it doesn't really seem useful in this sort of situation and then I just make everything a little bit bigger stretch it out alright so now what you're gonna wanna do is label your title as well as your X and Y axis so you can just click on chart title here and change it so rather than saying the effect of the IV on the DV, I'm just going to call this prices of various items. Okay, and then to edit your X and Y, label your X and Y, you're going to want to go to Advanced Edit. So over here, you're just going to scroll down a little bit, and you'll see the axis here in the titles. It's it's already set on horizontal, which is your x. You you always want to put your independent variable on the x-axis and your dependent variable on the y. So right now it's set to your horizontal, which is your x. So you want to put your independent variable. So our independent variable in this situation are the items, and then you just click on the sidebar here, switch it to left vertical and then you can put in your dependent variable on your y-axis which would in this case be the price and we'll just label it as a dollar sign here just for kicks alright so now that's in and you can do a couple other things like you can change the colors I'm sure all your students will figure out how this works I'm sure everyone will figure out how that works so now you want to put your graph on your Google Doc on your on your lab report. So just click here on the top right this little arrow here and you're gonna to want to go to copy chart and then go to your lab report. I have a lab report template already made here and I usually share that with the students. It makes everyone's life a lot easier. So then go to graph. Go, I'm gonna to go to the part where I'm just bring the cursor to where you want the graph to go and then you go to edit and paste and you may have to go to uh, web clipboard if you have already copy and pasted several different graphs. So if you don't get it right away on paste, you can just go here and you'll find it there. So then when I paste it in, it will appear here. It's a little too big, so I just need to make it a little smaller. And there you go. That is how to put a graph on Google Docs. All right, so now I'm gonna show you how to make a scatter plot using Google Spreadsheet. So you can go ahead and highlight your um, two variables. I have length and mass. I measure the length and mass of spaghetti. And insert chart. Go to charts, scatter, click on the top box here, and then customize. And you can go ahead and plug in your your variables here. So if you scroll down, 
and go to this box you can switch it to vertical and then switch it to horizontal and you can see that both of my variables are plugged in and what I wanted to show you on the bottom here is you can now put in tread lines this is a new thing that Google Spreadsheet has so you can select a linear tread line and then hit insert and you got your spreadsheet the only thing that you may want to do is get rid of this little guy here I don't really find it too necessary and then you can just uh, make this a little a little bigger so you have more space it, you can do it you don't have to do it I prefer to to give the actual graph itself as much space as possible I think it looks a lot better that way and you can even get rid of the grid lines change the color do whatever you need to do so that's how you make a scatter plot now I'm going to show you how to make a multiple line graph a regular line graph would be just the same but you wouldn't have as many variables that you see here so you can see that I have four and they're all going to be measured on a time of uh, 10 it's going to be 10 minutes so what you have to do is highlight this area here you don't want to highlight the title and then click insert chart go to your charts go to line select this and you'll notice one problem is that you can see what happened here everything's a little messed up and then there's just this one line here you don't want that so you want to go back to start and then say use column A as labels and then after that what will happen is everything will adjust itself correctly so then you just can go to customize and insert your title always remember to insert your title guys I really like to emphasize that and then you insert your X and Y axis remember it's the independent and dependent variable One thing that you may want to do is insert the minimum and maximum so they all show and then you're all set, ready to go. So at that point you can just, you can adjust things a little bit if you want to. You know me, I always like to resize things to make it so the graph itself is the maximum size. I think you should always do that so it looks just a lot better. All right, that's how you make a multiple line graph. All right, so we're gonna finish this Science of Science by now talking about the conclusion and improvements. So the way that I have it set up for the students is that the first four paragraphs are about the conclusion and the fifth paragraph is on improvements for the lab. So the way that you see this set up is you see on the top it says conclusion 1A. So what that means is this is the things that you want to address for one part of your first paragraph. So everything that pertains to conclusion one is for your first paragraph. When you see conclusion two, that's for your second paragraph and so on and so forth. So what you guys as students need to take notes on is the things that you see in green. And what you see in black is a question that can help you address the things you need to address for paragraph one. So the first thing you need to do is look at the data table and describe the trends or patterns in the numbers. What does it mean about the variables that were investigated? So what that is saying is when you change the independent variable, how did the independent how did the dependent variable change? Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it stay the same? And our example here is when the from gold dog food um, was used instead of science diet the dog's mass decreased by four pounds after three weeks so see how specific that is and then in the second part you need to make an inference using your data what will most likely continue to happen beyond the graph so this is after three weeks based on this data what do you think will happen after three weeks the dog continues to eat this from dog food and I'll tell you right now guys this is the part that you guys have a lot of trouble with or in, in, so what you'll do is either not do it or do something that's really weird really simple you just need to say what will happen to the dog's mass after three weeks well it'll probably continue 
the dog will continue to lose some mass, but not as much because you could see in that third week they did the dog didn't lose nearly as much mass as it did in the first and second. Moving on to the second part of the first paragraph of our conclusion, 1B, evaluate the hypothesis. Use data to state whether it is or is not supported. All right, this is really easy to do because all you need to do is look at your hypothesis from above in the lab report and see if the data backs it up or does not back up what happened. So I wrote here the hypothesis was that if the, do if the type of dog food is changed to the brand from then the dog's mass will decrease because from has healthier ingredients for the dog. The data collected supports the hypothesis. The dog lost four pounds in three weeks by switching to from. Really basic what you need to do here. The only thing you need to make sure is that when you say the word hypothesis, you say either supports or not supports. Don't say proved. Don't say correct or incorrect. Just say supports or not supports. Moving on to conclusion 2a, what variables were kept constant in the experimental procedure? How did this improve the validity of the experiment? Here you explain the things that you kept constant. You should do at least three. In your paragraph you should have at least three. During the experiment, time the dog was fed, the amount of food and the time that the dog's mass was taken was kept constant. Validity is improved only when one variable was investigated. So here's what you do for the validity part. You write something about how you only changed one thing and how if you didn't change one thing, it would have made the experiment not be a controlled experiment. If more than one variable was changed during the experiment, it would be unclear to know which variable was changing the dog's mass. The dog food brand could be the only variable changed in order for this experiment to be valid. So you're just justifying why you only changed one thing. How is consistency kept while conducting the experiment? Now this one's always a tricky one for kids because consistency is different from constant variables. It's referring to the methods or the technique that you and your partners use in the experiment. And this is actually really, really hard to do without a pronoun either because you're referring to yourself and what you did, but you still can't use a pronoun. Because remember, in all lab reports, you can't have a pronoun anywhere. Let's take a look at what I wrote here. Consistency was kept in the experiment by making sure the dog stayed on the digital scale for a long enough time for the scale to settle on a number. The dog needed to be calm and sitting. So no pronouns there. And also that is something that you probably didn't mention too well in your procedure, but it really helped out get the numbers that you wanted to get for good results. Moving on to conclusion paragraph three. This is when you have to talk about whether your data is accurate or precise and was it reliable. So here are the three definitions just to uh, just to review for the three words. Accuracy is how close your data is to that true value. But in most cases, you're not going to have a true value unless we have a large number of data points that we could have taken together as a class or something. And if there is, you just compare those true value to your trials to see how close it is to that very strong average, which we call the true value in that case. Usually, you have to write that your data isn't really accurate because you don't have a true value. Now with precision, you could usually do precision as long as you have three or more trials. So you just look at the three numbers within your trials and see how close they are to each other. The closer they are, the more precise it is. And reliable is when your data is both accurate and precise. So the sad truth is, guys, that um, your data won't usually be reliable because you're not going to have a true value. So that knocks off accurate. Even if you are precise but not accurate, you're still not reliable. So you'll have to say that the data is not reliable most of the time in class. Let's take a look at an example for paragraph three. Multiple dogs would be needed in order to have multiple trials. The dogs would need to be the same breed and start with the same mass. This experiment cannot be precise. There is no average, just one mass taken each day. Therefore, this experiment is not accurate. The experiment taken cannot be reliable because it is not known from the lack of data whether it is accurate or precise. Now I realize that's not really a helpful paragraph for you guys. If you click on the bottom right here, 
it can jump you right to the most important words in science at the section when they talk about accuracy and precision and compare data table if you need review looking at a data table that is actually accurate or precise or neither or both. All right, conclusion paragraph four. How does this lab relate to the real world? This is where you connect the hypothesis and the data to the real world, make some sort of connection. Why are we doing this lab? What's the big picture? You'll need to do some outside research. The type of food that a dog eats has an effect on their mass and health. Some cheaper brands use byproduct animals that are used as fillers in the food. The dog does not receive proper nutrition and gains fat when it needs protein. The dog doesn't feel full and eats more. This experiment supports that a healthier brand and possibly more expensive brand can lower the mass of an overweight dog. I hope you guys get the understanding of what type of ex research you may need to do with these labs from looking at this. I really want you to take some time and make the big picture. I see a lot of students not really do this and they lose points on this section of the lab. Here's how to make your improvements. I have for you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Here's the good. You should make three improvements, at least three. You get points for doing three. Here's what you should do on the first one. You should explain that you should add more trials. More trials are better. How many more? You should explain how many more would do it by looking at what type of numbers you have. Are they not very precise? Do you have a large range? So more trials would help bring you to the true value, especially if there were outliers. That way you can get rid of the outliers and then do more trials. The second thing you should do for an improvement is suggest some sort of new constant variable. So one of those three constant variables, add a fourth one. If more dogs are used, the initial mass should be constant. Think of a way to improve the lab itself, like a step to add in the procedure. Maybe your procedure wasn't as repeatable as it could be. The do and I have here that the dog's daily routine should remain consistent, like when it walks and where it goes to get food and sleep. Here's the bad. This one drives me crazy. Kids say, make a graph. How does making a graph improve your lab? It doesn't do anything for your lab. It just adds color and flair. It's not necessary to make your lab a better lab. Second one, suggesting a different independent variable, like test the amount of exercise instead. Why would you have that for an improvement of your lab? That could be a further investigation, but I'm not having you do that that you, that doesn't make your lab better by telling them to do a different independent variable. And then another one suggesting things that wouldn't really matter, like adding some blame to your dog. That's not gonna help your dog lose weight. And here's the ugly. These are things that I've actually seen before. Make a robot do it. Why would a robot help? You can't just say make a robot do it. Have less trials because it's really hard to find the average. I've had someone say that. Have a different lab partner. I had somebody rant about their lab partner for a whole paragraph and how they ruined their lab. And then this one I see pretty commonly. Change the air pressure or some other weird environmental thing that wouldn't really matter. Well, now you know how to write a lab report. So here's some quick tips in helping you in your scientific writing technique. If the word is shown in the packet and you spell it wrong, I'm gonna take points off. Know your grammar. Effect is a noun, affect is a verb. Farther is a physical distance and further is an idea. I actually hear adults make that mistake all the time. You rarely need to use the word data. You can be more specific and actually say the DV. Always refer back to the independent and dependent variable in the conclusion. The IV and the DV are the most important part, and I can tell when you know and when you don't. You can't use pronouns in the lab, like ever. Pronouns make it about you and not about the data. Remember to always be formal. Don't start a sentence with, well, blah, 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 or I think, doobly, doobly, do. Do not finish paragraphs with, and that is why. Those are just informal things. We did it, guys. We got through the science of science part two. Now you are scientific paper experts. You know how to do this. Things to look at when you have your lab ready to go. Safety procedures. Not actually concluding on the trends. Forgetting their title on the data table and their graph. 
You gotta capitalize your data table and your graph. It's like a book. Forgetting about the real world connections, presentation skills of being confident, your accuracy and precise, that's how you get reliable. Missing the difference between consistency and content variables and forgetting pronouns, pronouns, pronouns. Can't have pronouns. And just not using the rubric or even looking at it. Those are things that I've seen kids have trouble with. Use this to help you so you can get an A plus on your next lab report. All right, guys, take care.